Hi and welcome everyone. My name is Karin Sumis and I'm the senior curator at the Gardner Museum. <clears throat> welcome to our Renaissance Venice Life and Luxury at the Crossroads exhibition, digital exhibition programs. You will notice that your mics and videos were muted and that the chat option has been disabled. There will be a Q&A following uh, today's demonstration. So we, we invite you to um, send us your questions through the Q&A function at any point. However, um, we're going to take questions as they come as well. So uh, please feel free to, uh, to react as soon as you have um, a question for Lindsay. Please note that the closed captioning provided is automated and that any information that appears is not reviewed for accuracy. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Toronto is located on the treaty lands and ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Petun, and the, Miss the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The community we work in is the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to, to learn and live on this land. Today, we're very excited, excited to welcome artist Lindsay Montgomery, whose work is on view in the Renaissance Venice Life and Luxury at the Crossroads exhibition. Uh, the exhibition is on until January 9, 2022, so you'll have a chance to see her work in person. So just a few words about Lindsay before we begin. Lindsay Montgomery works across a variety of media, including ceramics, painting, and puppetry to create narrative videos, performances, and objects. Her work is focused on creating personal mythologies that address topics and issues, including health, death and mysticism, feminism, and evolving modes of power. She earned a BFA from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design and received an MFA from the University of Minnesota. Her work has been exhibited in Canada and internationally, including at the Gardner Museum and the Archie Bray Foundation. She's also the recipient of numerous awards, including the Winifred Shantz Award for Ceramics, the, jo the Joyce Caroline Memorial Scholarship in the Graphs Endowment, and an individual project grant from the, the Canada Council for the Arts. Her work is, including, is included in the permanent collections of various museums, including the Musée des Beaux-Arts de Montréal, the Canadian Clean Glass Gallery in Waterloo, and the Garner Museum in Toronto. She currently lives and works in Toronto and is represented by Gal Galerie Trois in Canada and Galerie Lefebvre in France. So it's a pleasure to welcome you, Lindsay. Um, so please take, take over and uh, we can start the demonstration. Sure, thank you very much, Corrine. That was a lovely introduction. Um, so in conjunction with my participation in the Venice exhibition, uh, what I'm gonna demonstrate today is how to make a press molded plate and then um, add some extra embellishment to the rim using coils and other hand building techniques. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the materials that I have here. So first I have um, a plaster press mold that I'm gonna use to make sort of the basic uh, shape of the plate. Um, so in my studio, I have a variety of these. This is a really small one. Um, I tend to work quite a bit bigger, but for the uh, constraints of time that we have today for this demonstration, I'm just gonna do a sort of smaller version. Um, but basically what I do is I go around to um, Value Village and the dollar store and other kind of thrift store situations. And I look for different kind of uh, plate shapes in forms that I, that I like. Uh, and sometimes I use plastic, metal, ceramic, whatever I can find. Um, and I bring that back to my studio and I uh, cast the, the inside of the plate in plaster. And then that becomes um, a nice plaster hump mold that I can use to make sort of the basic shape of my plate. So that's gonna go here on the banding wheel. Um, and then uh, my work is low fire. So I work um, exclusively in red terracotta clay. Uh, so that's what I'll be using here today. And the first thing that I'm gonna to do to create the slab that uh, I'll need to put on top of the press mold is to just make a nice round slab. Um, so I'm gonna do that by using uh, this rubber mallet that I've put some fabric over so that it doesn't stick to the clay um, and a rolling pin. You can also use a, a slab roller to do this if you have access to one. I don't have a slab roller in my studio, so I just do it um, sort of more by hand like this. Uh, and so I start out with my clay sort of in a, loose kind of circular shape because my plate is circular. Often I make oval shaped plates as well. So I kind of try and get my lump of clay into basically the shape that I want to create off my mold. 
And then I'll take my rubber mallet and just start to flatten it. Great workout, I imagine, <laughs> if you make many of these every day. <laughs> it's a great way to uh, get all of your feelings out. Yes. So um, once I have the slab sort of more into a flatter shape, I'll move over to using the rolling pin. Can you use the same mold as many times as you like, or is there like a limited number? Of times? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for my practice, um, I would say I can, I will have the same molds forever in production. Um, plaster does kind of break mm -hmm. down eventually after it gets kind of repeatedly saturated with water. Um, but because, you know, I'm just a one artist making not a huge number of pieces, I mm -hmm. tend to, to be able to kind of keep my molds forever. So I'm going to move to the rolling pin now. And in my own studio, um, sometimes because I don't have a slab roller, uh, I use just some sticks, like some wooden dowels or uh, something that I can kind of place on either side of this so that when I'm rolling the rolling pin over, it's going to um, control the thickness of my slab. Um, but when I don't have access to that, what I'll just use is my pin tool here, this needle tool. Um, and it's a great way to just kind of poke into the slab and I can gauge what the thickness of the mm -hmm. um, slab is. So it's still quite a bit too thick for what I'm doing. Uh, but the other thing that I want to do while I'm making my slab is make sure that it doesn't have air bubbles or um, folds. So I'm going to use this metal rib to smooth out the surface. And then once I kind of have it about an inch thick, I'll start to kind of stretch it out just by kind of tossing it like this. Mm -hmm. And then after each toss, I'll kind of give it a go over with my metal rib. Mm -hmm. So for those who might be less familiar, if you have air bubbles in your clay, so can you explain what would be the consequences of that? Sure. Um, so the reason that you don't want air trapped in your clay is because when your piece goes into the kiln, um, as the kiln starts to heat up, that uh, air bubble is going to want to escape and become steam, and that can often lead to um, pieces exploding in the kiln. Um, so when you're making slabs, it's kind of easy because what tends to happen is when you pass the rolling pin over the slab, if you do have air bubbles in the clay, you'll see them sort of raise to the surface, mm -hmm. and then you can take the needle tool and just kind of pop them and then go over again with the metal rib and all is good. Um, but I will mention that it's it's great to make sure that your clay is really quite well wedged before you start to um, slap your slab out. And wedging is something that we do to remove air from the clay. And it's kind of similar to um, kneading a piece of dough for bread, but it's kind of the opposite. When you're kneading dough for bread, you're trying to add air into the mixture, whereas this process, we're trying to remove any air. So getting there, I'm gonna check the thickness again. And that's about a quarter of an inch. So for this size of plate, that's about the appropriate thickness for the slab. If I was making a larger piece, um, I would increase the thickness of my slab accordingly. So I'm going to give that one more pass with the metal rib on both sides. And then this is a really important next step. Um, I will now take my mold and place it over top of the slab and make sure that it fits. So this mold is not very deep. It's a very shallow plate. Um, so I don't need my slab to, to go too far out beyond the edge of the mold. Um, but a good rule of thumb with this is to um, leave about an inch around the outside um, when you cut away the slab with the knife. So this is my fettling knife. This is kind of my number one tool in the studio. I use this all the time. And I'm just going to just loosely by hand, uh, freehand just go around the edge. And like I said, leave about an inch around. And I'm always trying to keep track of my 
um, scrap clay as I'm going along because I'll use that later on in the process to do some of the embellishment that I'm going to do on the rim. And I'm keeping it covered while I'm not using it so it doesn't dry out. So this is great now I can uh, that my slabs a little bit smaller. I still feel like it could just be a little bit thinner so I'm just gonna slap it out just a bit more. And I'll check it one more time with my pin tool and give it one last rib before I place it on the mold. So in my studio, I have a really big table that's completely covered in canvas. And that's great because the clay doesn't stick to it. And because I mostly do a lot of hand building, I like to uh, have that surface to work on, but it will leave a texture on the surface of the clay. So if that's something that you don't want, you have to make sure that you smooth out the piece of clay before you lay it onto the mold. So if you produce a series of plates, would you um, create all your shapes uh, all at once and then bisque fire them all and then turn to decoration or would you kind of decorate as you go? How? Uh, yeah, that's usually how I do work in my studio. Um, because I have a small space that I work in, mm -hmm. I tend to um, either be in production making mode or in painting mode. So okay. I'll make a number of pieces, bisque fire, and then the studio kind of switches over to painting mode. And then I'm usually kind of within that uh, aspect of the process for several months. So I'm just going to put the banding wheel up here so you guys can really see what I'm doing. And then I'm going to take my slab and just loosely drape it over the form. And then I'm just going to start to um, really gently press um, the slab into place. So this mold, as I mentioned, is quite a simple form. It really just has the one uh, kind of change in direction where the inside of the, the plate and then there's the rim. Um, some of the shapes that I do are much more complex than that. So that's something to be aware of when you're placing the slab onto the mold, you press, you wanna make sure you know where the deepest and um, more ornate points of um, the form are so that you can really like work the clay into that area. So for this one, there's really just the one spot here, which is that little bit of a corner where uh, the center of the plate meets the edge. So I wanna start with just making sure that I'm pushing the clay into that area so that I'm picking up that bit of detail from the mold. And sometimes this will be a time when you'll um, start to notice that you've got some trapped air and that's okay too. You can always just take your pin tool and just uh, let it release it. So now I wanna just go around and press all of the slab into the form of the plate on the rim and in the center point. And when I'm doing this kind of work in my studio, I'm always working on the banding wheel because I want to be able to turn the piece uh, as I'm working. I would say if you don't have a wheel in your studio, uh, investing in a banding wheel is one of the most useful tools that you can have um, for doing this kind of work. And with earthenware, because um, this particular earthenware doesn't have a lot of um, sand or what we call in ceramics grog, um, which we add to a clay body in order to give it more strength and more of a um, tooth to hold structure, this clay is really smooth. So it's possible to do some of this work with a sponge. Um, but I never do because I don't want to introduce more water onto the piece because the idea is that I'm taking the slab, which is already quite wet, and I'm putting it over top of this form. And then I'm asking the plaster mold to start to pull the moisture from the clay slab. And that in turn is going to stiffen the clay that's up top and allow the um, plate to release from the mold. So I'm just going to use my fingers. I think with, uh, with earthenware, as I said, that doesn't have a lot of um, sand or grit in it. It's really easy to just use your, um, the pad of your thumb to get a really nice smooth surface. 
And then the next thing to do is to take care of this rim. So obviously I've got extra clay hanging over the edge of my mold. And this is my super professional uh, tool that I use for this, which is a cheese cutter that I got from the dollar store. And this is really my most prized um, tool in the studio because I use it all the time for making plates. So I know where the edge of my plate is here because I can kind of see where I've pressed. Um, so first of all, because the depth of my tool is not more than about an inch and a half, I wanna just cut off the excess clay, but I'm not going all the way to the edge of the mold. I'll do a more precision cut once I get a little bit of this clay out of the way. So again, I'm taking all my scraps and keeping them nice and compact so I can use them to make more coils later. And the other reason this is good is because sometimes when you um, are cutting the edge of the plate, you'll get a little bit of plaster uh, cut off coming down onto that extra clay. And having uh, plaster in your clay is something that you really don't want because it's another thing that can potentially give you problems in the firing. Um, so if I cut off this last piece for the edge and I find there's a little bit of plaster dust or chunks in it, I'll just discard that piece of clay because I don't want it to um, go back into the piece or go into my recycling in the studio because it will cause me problems. So now I'm going to cut the edge off with my cheese cutter. So I'm keeping my uh, left hand on the banding wheel so I can rotate it while I'm working. And it's important with this gesture that you sort of set your tool in place and kind of do the whole thing at once and kind of follow through and not kind of stop and start if you want to get that really nice clean edge on your piece. So I'm going to push my tool in until I hit the mold and then all in one gesture, I'm going to turn with my left hand and just cut that extra clay off. And that looks pretty good. I don't see any plaster bits in there. So I'm just going to reuse that piece of clay as well. And then what you're left with is quite um, a sharp angle where uh, the, the tool cut away that slab. And so what I'm gonna do there is just take my finger and just run around. Again, I'm gonna use my left hand to turn the banding wheel and I'm just gonna soften that edge. So because my work um, tends to have a lot of hand built, hand built coiled additions, I really wanna make sure that this edge that I'm creating on my plate has some uh, meat to it. Um, I think one of the things that a lot of people tend to do when they're starting out with ceramics is make their edges a little too thin. Um, and I really wanna keep lots of um, dimension on this edge here because I'm later gonna attach uh, more pieces of clay to it. So I'm not doing too much here except just running my finger around um, and just making that nice and round instead of having a corner. Because my work um, almost exclusively is glazed in, my, in a technique called myolica. Uh, and that's a type of glaze that we dip earthenware in in order to paint on the surface. Myolica really doesn't like sharp edges and corners. So if I left that edge quite sharp on the piece, uh, when I'm glazing, I would notice that I would be able to see the clay through because the glaze is gonna have a hard time um, or holding onto or sinking into that really sharp bit of corner. Interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm going to just use my rib and smooth out the rest of the plate. This is kind of something I'll come back to a couple of times while the piece is sitting on the mold. Right now the clay is very wet. Um, so as the clay starts to stiffen, it starts to become easier to come in and smooth out the surface. So what I'm really worried about right now is just getting rid of any sort of major dents or divots any air bubbles that I might see. Um, but knowing that, you know, if I'm in my studio, I'd leave this on the mold and maybe in 45 minutes or so, I would come back and I would do a little bit more smoothing. And I'd probably do that two or three times before the piece is actually ready to come off the mold. Um, and usually it takes, again, it's, it really is drastically different depending on the size of the plate that you're making. But for a small plate like this, it's usually ready to come off the, uh, the mold within an hour or two based on the humidity conditions within uh, your studio or wherever you're, you're making your pieces. So I'm just gonna finish smoothing this out. And then I have another uh, complete plate that I made in my studio yesterday. 
So that's kind of the, the, the rhythm um, that I use for making plates. I'll press them uh, one day. So have the piece on the mold. And then when this is ready to come off the mold, I'll take it off the mold. And then what I have is something like this. So this is the piece that I made in my studio yesterday. Um, so one of the things that tends to happen when you're taking um, the piece off the mold is, uh, you know, especially when it's a quite a flat piece like this, is sometimes you'll have a little bit of sag happening with the rim of the piece. And so a really great way to deal with that is to, again, always use the banding wheel. And then I sort of get low and just come around and lift that rim up a little bit. And because it's had you know, 12, 14 hours to sort of set up in the studio overnight, it was covered, um, but still just being on the wood board like this tends to pull some moisture out of it and it allows me to have enough um, solid, solidification in the clay for me to come around and now sort of lift that rim up and make it look a little bit less flat. Um, so I'll talk about ribs for a second. This metal rib is um, kind of a really critical tool for me in the studio. This is the one that you want to use when you're trying to find air bubbles or you're trying to scrape the surface. This is the scraping rib. And when you use it, you'll notice that you're getting a buildup of material that you're scraping off the piece. This red mud tool rib um, is more of a smoothing rib. So this is the kind of rib that I would use once the piece is set up a little bit like this. And I've kind of gotten rid of all the air bubbles and problems um, first. And now I just wanna come in with this rib and really smooth out the surface and make it look really nice. At which point in your studies did you perfect this process or was it after you graduated? Um, well, when I was going to NASCAD, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, um, I was really lucky to be able to uh, apprentice with a potter named Jim Smith over the summer between my um, first and second year at NASCAD. And he had a um, production pottery in Nova Scotia. And uh, predominantly what my job was working for Jim was making press molded plates. So I really got a lot of hands-on experience just making hundreds of plates over that summer um, for Jim to decorate. Um, and then kind of thought about, you know, how I wanted to uh, take that into, you know, sort of my own practice and direction. So I really learned how to press mold plates um, when I was in my undergrad, but it wasn't until maybe five or six years ago that I really started doing this kind of process of taking the found objects, casting them, and then um, making them into quite different shapes by mm -hmm. adding hand-built um, elements to them like coils and um, some sculptural uh, yeah. details as well. And you have some amazing uh, pieces displayed in the shop as well right now. Yeah, there's one plate in there that I made with this process. Uh, sometimes the one that's in the shop right now, I also uh, sometimes instead of at doing an additive um, embellishment to the piece, I'll take cutouts away. So the one that's in the shop right now has um, more of a cutout rim where I did the same process of casting the plate, but then came in with my knife. And um, I'm really low tech in the studio. So I tend to just use like paper cutouts and uh, things like that, and just cut away some of the detail from the rim as well. So there's kind of two ways to think about it. It's very much like sculpture. Um, you can make additive embellishments or subtractive embellishments. And I tend to sort of go back and forth and sometimes do both in one piece. So this is another tool that I can't live without in my studio. It's called a Sureform tool. This one's seen better days. It's a little bit rusty, but um, these are great tools and you buy the the tool and you can get replacement blades for it. But basically it's like a little um, cheese cutter or sorry, cheese grater uh, that you can come around and kind of shave off um, some uh, sharp edges on the piece. So I'm gonna just pass that over the edge to get rid of that little bit of hangover that came from the mold. And this is great. I take, when I'm doing this in my studio, I take all the scraps that come from 
my tools and that I um, make into my joining slip. So this is a theme for me. I hate recycling clay in my studio. So I try and find a use um, for all my little bits that are coming off uh, and also just conserve all of my scraps while I'm going so that I'm not wasting clay. All right, now I'm just gonna do another pass with the red mud tool rib. And then I'm just going to set this aside so I can make some coils for the rim that I'm going to do. So for this particular rim, I kind of usually approach doing the embellishments to the rims of my plates in two ways. I'm either um, separating the piece into quadrants uh, and I'll start doing the embellishment sort of on the, the four points of the, the X. And that's a great way to split up the composition and kind of keep things symmetrical. Um, so I'll do that if I want to do a kind of design that has this kind of top and bottom and, and really um, designated sides. Uh, but I also will do a continuous pattern around the outside. And that's what I'm going to show today. So it's helpful um, when you're doing that kind of decoration to take another super high tech tool here, which is just my little piece of string. Um, and that's what I'll use to just measure the distance around the edge of my rim. And then I can either place that on a ruler or a tape measure. Again, really, really low tech, but a really handy way to um, figure out very quickly what the circumference of your circle is. So we'll set that aside. And now I'm gonna make some coils that will act as my decoration. So here's my leftover clay that I cut off from uh, pressing my plate. I'm gonna clean off my board so there's no little bits of dried stuff that are gonna get stuck in my coils. And when I'm using uh, rolling coils to do this kind of thing, I like to give my board a little bit of a spritz down with my uh, water bottle before I start to roll. And that helps to keep the coils really hydrated so they don't crack and um, just not look as nice as they could if they were rolled on a slightly damp surface. So this is a piece of clay that I've wedged already. This was my other scrap ball. So in order to get that ready to become a coil, I'll give that just a little bit of a wedge too. So this is the gesture that we use to remove the air bubbles from the clay and kind of make smooth again a bunch of pieces that we're putting together. Set that aside. And then when I'm rolling coils, I like to try and get the piece of clay as close to a coil as I can before I start to roll. Um, this is one of the things I hear from my students all the time. That's one of the sort of the trickiest things to master um, is rolling coils. But now I feel like it's such a dominant part of the way that I make my objects that it's it's probably the most used gesture that I do in my studio so it's something I'm pretty comfortable with but just like with anything this is true of throwing or um, if you're building forms with coils you want to kind of set things up into the shape that you want them to be before you start to manipulate them so I'm making this little sausage of clay and in my own studio I have a table that's about seven feet long and uh, four feet wide and it is completely covered with canvas so I'm able to make you know seven foot long coils and I do that because then I can sort of wind them up and have a mass of coil that I can either use to do embellishments on my pieces or if I'm coil building a form which I often do uh, I want to make the most out of um, having a really nice long coil to use and it also you know keeps that coil a consistent diameter. If I was in my own studio and I had to always be rolling coils on just a small board like this, there'd probably be a lot more discrepancy between um, the diameter of my coils and I want them to be as consistent as possible. So I also taper this edge as well. 
So all the deeper vases and vessels, uh, such as the one that are now in the shop, do you all make them using coils or? Yeah, they're, yeah? they're all coil built, yeah. Sometimes I'll use, um, I have a few press molds um, that I use in my studio for sort of basic shapes. But again, I tend to work by starting with um, a press molded form or a thrown form and then hand building uh, mm -hmm. on top of that to change to change the form a little bit. Mm -hmm. So your work never involves the wheel? I, it hasn't for quite a while. And I think that's mostly just been because um, I like working quite large. And so I'm not sure that I could make the size of pieces that I would like to make. It's easier for me to make them by hand building. But I recently just got a new wheel. So now I'm thinking a little bit more about the uh, potential for generating forms uh, using that tool as well. Um, but yeah, for the most part, the way that I work is kind of making a bunch of parts and assembling them. So I think if I did return to doing some more thrown forms, it would be more to generate parts for um, more elaborate pieces mm -hmm. that will come together with a few different forms. So my students always ask me why I roll my coils only with one hand because <laughs> I always teach everybody to roll their coils like this. And I think it's because I just do it so much in my studio and it allows me to <laughs> drink water at the same time. Drink water or tea while I'm rolling my coils. Um, but it's really important when you're rolling coils to try and use your whole hand. So right from your wrist all the way to, the, to your fingertips. And if your coil is not rolling on the table, it's not round. And this is one of the, the main things that happens with beginners for coils is you tend to get a bit more of an oval shape going. Um, and that makes it difficult to get a longer coil and to have your coils sort of be consistent for the purpose that I'm gonna use them for today. And if your coils kind of get to the point where they're hanging off the side of your board, what I usually do is just nip it in half and then keep rolling. So for, for this, for my big pieces, this would be sort of the um, kind of thickness of the coils that I would use, like at least an inch, if not a little bit more. But for a smaller piece like this, I'm gonna reduce that diameter of the coils a little bit just so it uh, matches the size of the plate a little bit better. And you can see because of the way that I've rolled the coils on the damp board like that, there's really no, it's quite a consistent coil. It doesn't have any uh, cracks or um, air pockets or anything. And that's what I'm looking for because I wanna chop this up into little pieces that are all gonna be uh, pretty consistent. And if you do feel that your coil kind of comes off of the, its roundness and you can feel it sort of bumping um, onto the canvas, just find where that bump is and, and sort of work it out. Another thing that one of my students actually showed me, which is a really great technique, is to lift your coil up and give it a little bit of a twist mm. and put it back down because that, um, you know, when you get that kind of oval thing going with your coils, it tends to be in one spot all the way down the coil. And so by just giving it that little bit of a twist, it kind of disperses that unevenness and it makes it easier to, to roll it out round again. Okay, so there's one. And I keep the ends really tapered like this because um, when you're rolling coils, it's really easy to trap air in the end of your, of your coil. And again, we, we know why we don't wanna trap air mm -hmm. anywhere on our piece. And so again, when I'm um, about to uh, put a rim on one of my plates, I want to have all the material to do all of the um, embellishments uh, prepared when I um, get set up to, to start that process because you want the clay to all be at the same stage of dryness. Uh, the best recipe for success in ceramics is when you're assembling things that everything is sort of at the same stage of dryness so that mm -hmm. once everything is assembled, then the whole piece can kind of dry uh, together. And if you have, you know, a really dry 
plate that's come off the mold and then you're going to put really soaking wet coils on top of that, um, your dryness is not going to be um, very symbiotic. And, and sometimes that is a really um, easy way to create cracks in the piece because where that wet piece is meeting that more dry piece, we're having uneven shrinkage. And for anyone that um, is unfamiliar, clay goes through a shrinking process uh, from the wet stage of what we're doing right now to the fired stage, you're going to lose about 10% um, depending on the clay body of the mass of the piece. And so whenever you're making anything, you have to really be thinking about that shrinkage. If you're a production potter, it's going to make a big difference with the way, you know, someone's hand is able to uh, use a handle for a mug or um, with my pieces, it's the, it's that, you know, putting all these pieces together, I want to make sure that they can then dry successfully together. So I'm trying to attach everything when the clay is at the same stage. So when you work on a piece, uh, you would then like do the shape, do the, the basic the base of the plate and then roll your coils and let everything kind of go through the same process simultaneously so that your coils are yeah, exactly. So I've kind of got it down to the point mm -hmm. now where it's like, make the plate on the make the plate form on the mold one day, it goes overnight till the next day, then I'm rolling the coils. Uh, and then this next part here, I'll show you. So I want to do kind of a, a wave pattern around the outside of this. So I'm going to use, um, I'm going to measure out and use like a bunch of uh, lengths of coil that are the same length. So I'll just start cutting those with my knife. And I usually start by cutting the first one. It's going to be this kind of shape. And then if that looks good, then I'll know that I've got the, the size right. And I'll start to cut the rest of them. And ideally, I get all of the pieces that I need to do the rim um, out of one, one coil or, or one set of coils that I've um, made at the same time. So just to save for time today, because we probably won't be able to get the entire thing done, I'll just do as many as I have here, but that should get us most of the way. Okay, so here's all my uh, little lengths that I'm going to use for the edge. I'm going to clean up my scraps here. Set those aside. And then I'll bring the plate back over. And so for this um, part of the process, the tools that I'll be using are um, my fettling knife uh, and a serrated rib. So that's similar to the metal rib, but this one has, um, I'm not sure if you can really see it there, but it has little um, serrated edge on it so that I can scratch the surface of the clay because I wanna use a score and slip technique when I'm putting this together. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to do is, oh, and the other really important thing that I use for this uh, part of my process is this big bag of random foam. So this is the kind of foam that I usually order when I'm, uh, you know, packing up pieces to ship. Um, but whenever I have extra of this foam, I cut these little cubes out of it because this is what I'll use to help support the piece after I've done the rim um, as it's setting up so that the weight of the clay is not going to, you know, pull the edge of my plate down. And then I just kind of start. So when I'm bending my coils, if they get a little bit of cracks happening, I'll just smooth those out. And then I'll use my knife to cut the bottom the way that I would like. So usually at this stage, what I'm doing is I'm not actually going to connect anything. I'm just gonna place the, the pieces on and let them set up a little bit before I actually come in and do the scoring and slipping. And that's where this foam is really handy. So I'm just gonna take the piece and without doing the score and slipping, I'm just gonna like really gently put them into place and then use my little piece of foam to keep it from, from falling down. So this part of the process is a little bit tedious, but 
what I do. And the reason that I do this and I don't just go for it is because I want to make sure that, you know, it, it looks right and that I have enough pieces going around and this way um, I'm able to kind of make some adjustments as I'm going. And I've always got my scissors close by so that I can cut my foam pieces to the right dimension to hold things on. And it's actually better to do the attachments um, once the clay has set up a little bit anyway. It's going to hold the shape a little bit better. So this is how I'll go around and just prop everything with foam. And then again, this is another sort of like day in the studio. So uh, on a day when I would come in and do this, I would cut out all of the pieces to do the rim. I would place them like this. Um, and support them with the foam. And then I would usually cover that with plastic and let it sit overnight. And then the next day I'll come in uh, and start to actually score and slip all of the pieces into place. So that way, when I come to do the scoring and slipping, you know, there's not a lot, there's a little bit of movement left. It's sort of that um, last stage of leather hard uh, where I can still move the clay a little bit, but mostly it's holding its shape. So in total from beginning to end, how long does it take to make one plate of that size with that sort of size? Yeah, with the including the decoration, which we won't be showing today. Oh, including the decoration. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The making of the plate uh, probably only takes about four hours or maybe five hours, mm -hmm. um, but then the decorating of the piece can take up to a week. So uh, usually the way that um, process kind of unfolds is um, when I have a piece to paint, I'll sort of come into the studio the first day and that'll be the day that I um, lay the drawing out. So I'm um, just working in pencil and uh, that's kind of my hardest day when I'm decorating is trying to figure out laying out the drawing and the mm -hmm. composition and everything. And a lot of the time it doesn't go right and I have to kind of erase things and, and keep it going. And then it's more fun because once I have all the drawing in place and I know where everything's going, then it's just kind of like coloring um, when I'm doing the painting. But that process can take um, you know quite a long time as well. So for a piece this, this big, I would say, Painting would probably be three days. Um, for one of my big pieces, it can be up to 10 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very long process, but the result is really wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it is for sure a long process, but I don't know. I guess anybody that works in clay, um, you know, we all kind of come to and find our own way mm -hmm. of. Um, making the work that we want to make. And I think because I come from a background of painting, um, from the very beginning when I started working with ceramics, it was always, I was always in the back of my mind thinking about how to marry uh, the technique that I had learned as a painter with the new techniques that I was learning um, in ceramics. And that's why it was so great when uh, I was in my first year at Sheridan College and I saw uh, Myolica for the first time and thought, you know, this is really an amazing marriage of ceramics and painting and it has this other really incredible layer of being these beautiful um, ways in which you know the most important kind of myths and allegories of the day can be communicated uh, so that's what really brought me to this point with my practice Is that when you started to be interested in um, the, the stories that were popular in the Renaissance period, or did that come a bit later? Yeah, I guess when I was, you know, really got into looking at Myolica, and that was really why I um, went on to study at NASCAD, because Walter Ostrom, who was the uh, head of ceramics at NASCAD at that time, um, was very invested in the history of Myolica. And I, what I was really um, intrigued with Walter was that, you know, he was using the stories that we saw on these objects as a really performative, exciting way to talk about the history of, of human beings mm -hmm. as a whole. Um, and I started to think about how powerful that is, that there can be this medium where um, 
it's not it's in the domestic space so it's not something that's kind of elitist that you can only see in a museum or in a gallery these were things people had in their homes and that's really where i'm interested in my work living is with people in their homes um, but then there for there also to be this opportunity uh, for this really important sort of um, cultural information to live there. And I think what I started really noticing with the Renaissance pieces was like, wow, all of the things that we think about, the political situations and, um, you know, all of our mores and values and everything, you know, in the West have very much been shaped by the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, and this is the early modern era. And so I started really making a lot of connections from what I was seeing from these ancient pieces and kind of thinking like, hey, this hasn't really changed all that much. <laughs> and it seemed like a really um, powerful way to talk about the ways in which we have not evolved um, by using you know, these same images and just tweaking them a little bit or uh, just slightly changing them to, to make a bit of a different story or make a comment about why that story is still the same. For anyone who has questions in the audience, uh, please feel free to include your um, your questions in the uh, Q and A function. Uh, we're going to move into our discussion period uh, in a few minutes. So, yeah. So I'll just finish up with um, what I want to say about yes, attaching. Um, so once I have all these pieces in place, and then. As I say, what I usually do once I get everything set up with the foam like this, then I'll take a couple of sheets of plastic. And this is something else that I say to my students all the time, like really make sure when you're wrapping your pieces up that you're using enough plastic and several layers if you're going to leave it kind of overnight or for several days, um, because you don't want to lose uh, moisture on one part of the piece and not all the rest of it. And if you're trying to sort of maintain an equal um, well dispersed level of moisture throughout the whole piece, you wanna make sure you cover the whole thing. So getting everything in place, propping everything up with the foam uh, and then wrapping it with a couple layers of plastic. And then the next day I will come to my studio and then I begin the process like this. So I'll start back at the beginning again and I will use my pin tool here and I'm gonna mark where that little coil is sitting on the edge of my plate. And then I'm gonna use the serrated rib and scratch, and I'm gonna again scratch my coiled piece. And I often find that, you know, the serrated rib is not, um, it's not enough. So I'll scratch it with my serrated rib, but then I also come back in with my needle tool and score more deeply. Um, especially with earthenware, uh, for whatever reason, I, I find you really need to um, make your attachments really, really well scored and slipped. And then I'll use a lot of slip. If the clay is wet, you can probably get away with just using a little bit of water, which is what I'm gonna to do today. But in my own studio, I have a big ice cream container full of really nice thick slip. And when I'm doing this part, I don't really mind, I don't, I'm not taking too much care about how messy I'm being. I really want to see like the slip squishing out or um, you know that point of contact, like really, really strong on the piece. And I just kind of do the attachment, put the piece of foam back in place, and we'll move on and do the whole of the piece, quite messy, lots of slips sticking out everywhere. And then again, wrapped up with plastic overnight, and the next day I'll come in and start to um, clean up just with my finger and a sponge and make it look really nice and neat. That's great. So actually, since you were just talking about slip, we have a question that came in concerning slip. Can you explain what it is a bit more? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, the way that I kind of describe it here at the Gardener for my classes that are with uh, beginner students is that when you take two pieces of clay, when they're wet, it's really easy to just stick them together like that and they hold and you could put them into the queue for the kiln. But what's going to happen in the kiln is they're just going to fall apart. Um, so what we have to do to join things properly is a technique called score and slip. So instead of just taking the two pieces of wet clay and sticking them together like this, instead, I'm going to scratch up the surface a lot with a tool. And I like to use my needle tool for this. I've seen, you know, like a piece of wood with a bunch of nails in it is a popular 
uh, tool hack for this. And then you can either use water if the clay is quite wet or what slip um, really is, is just the clay body uh, with enough water added to it that it has kind of like a, when I'm doing it for these pieces, I like it to have sort of like a cream cheese consistency or like a frosting consistency. And then I'll slather a little bit of that onto my connections as well. And then those really scratched up surfaces when you stick them together are gonna really hold together and that going to the kiln is gonna really stay in place well. So score and slip is the way in which we join pieces of clay together. Great. Um, so um, I'm going to start going through the questions that came through the Q&A and sure. uh, the first one is um, asking whether we would be seeing um, a final work uh, that you've made. Um, I don't think you, you have a final, do you have a, a finished piece with you by any chance? I don't think I don't so. Have, I don't have a finished one of, of this piece, but if I tilt it up, you kind of can see. Yeah. And I mean, this is really what the piece will look like in greenware. And so we call greenware that what the piece looks like before mm -hmm. it has glaze in it. So mm -hmm. once this rim is done and attached and really cleaned up, um, I would send this to the bisque kiln and then it would come out as a piece of bisqueware. So that's something that's been fired sort of halfway to, to final temperature. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, all of my pieces get dipped into the white myolica glaze. So I use this terracotta clay because it's the traditional um, material that myolica has always been made out of. Uh, and I like the, the workability of earthenware, but also I really like that um, the history of myolica is so much about uh, this idea that myolica was invented to fake porcelain. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always been really attached to this sort of symbolic meaning behind earthenware as well, because it's like the people's clay. It's like the cheap everywhere it's found it's used for utilitarian things it's not it doesn't have the sort of opulence and um exclusivity that uh, i associate with porcelain so mm -hmm. i really like this idea that uh myolica in its time was sort of like the knockoff Louis it was <laughs> and there's something really great about that for me because i come from like a working class background and i i want to sort of dispel the sort of el the uh, elitism of um you know, fine ceramics, even though I'm very much making fine ceramics, but I like this idea that the, the, the history of this is that it's a ripoff of something that's more expensive. Yeah. Um, a follow-up question concerning your technique, um, which you've, you've, you've explained, but do you decorate before or after bisque firing? And uh, what are the, um, what sort of um, glazes do you use? Is there any underglaze being used or? So all of my decoration gets done, um, all of the surface decoration gets done after bisque. So once I finish with this piece, I would let it dry really slowly in my studio. And that's something I, I'll mention as well. When I finish one of these pieces that has all of this sort of elaborate cut and paste on the edge, I dry it really, really slow. So normally it kind of lives with a couple of sheets of plastic tucked underneath it for a week. And then I'll come in and sort of open up the plastic and let it sort of get a little bit of air for another week or so. Um, but I'm always in my process when I have things that I'm creating for, uh, for shows, um, I'm factoring in that really long uh, drying time because these pieces really need to dry slowly so that they can you know, maintain all of this structure. Um, but then after bisque, the, the pieces get dipped in the myolica glaze. Um, and so, yeah, I really just use the one glaze. Sometimes if I'm making a bigger, more sculptural piece and I can't dip it, that's one of the uh, sort of drawbacks of myolica is that it really works best if you can dip the piece into the glaze and get a really nice smooth surface for painting. Um, sometimes if that's not possible because I wanna work at a larger scale, um, I'll do slip, a white slip uh, instead of the myolica and then put some clear glaze over top of it. But over the last five or six years, I've really been focused on trying to make everything with this technique because I love it so much. Um, but yeah, the, the white myolica glaze, and then I use a, a whole um, range of things for my colorants. So uh, sometimes I'll work with the really traditional colorants that you can see um, displayed upstairs in the Venice exhibition. So cobalt oxide, cobalt carbonate, um, manganese, uh, iron yellow. Um, but then I'll also use things that are really commercially available. So I use um, some of the spectrum majolica colors that you can get um, from Tucker's or Pottery Supply House if you're local to Toronto. Um, or, you know, people will just be getting rid of stains and colorants. I'll kind of use everything. I do a lot of testing in my studio and I, I like to have a really um, 
big uh, group of colors to be able to, to work with when I'm making a big mm -hmm. piece. So yeah, one glaze, but all kinds of colorants that I'm using as overglaze dec decoration. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. that's a beauty of Mayolica, how vivid and colorful it is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So um, a question uh, from um, a group of um, second, years, uh, second year students at, at Sheridan College. Who are um, uh, who are saying that this is a fantastic demo, and they're wondering if co if coils can be pre-made, wrapped in plastic, and then later on still be as plastic as you would need for the big bending. Uh, theoretically, yes, I think you could mm -hmm. do that. But I've found that you know, with little pieces of coil like this, even if you wrap them up in a couple layers of plastic. Um, you know, one day, depending on the humidity levels within your space, uh, can make it so that they don't have enough flexibility for you to um, get all of this done in one go. So my recommendation is to make the coils, make the pieces and do all of this step all at once. Uh, and, you know, the way I described, like making the plate on the plate mold the first day, making the embellishment the next day and propping it up with the foam and then the third day uh, doing all of the attaching and then the fourth day coming in and uh, cleaning up all of your connections. Um, so it's not four full days of work, but it's four steps that I think really benefit from having that full day of uh, setting up in between. Um, or we, we have another question that is tied to this, uh, this, this actual process about cleaning the slip underneath uh, the object, the excess slip without turning the plate. How do you manage that? Yeah, that's tricky. Um, with this one, I can just get my finger in. Um, and I would say this is the smallest kind of piece that I would make. Most of the pieces that I do this with are a bit larger. And so this rim here is a little bit higher up off the board. So for the most part, I don't have too much trouble getting a finger underneath and just cleaning um, that underneath spot. But one thing that you really don't want to do at this point is lift the piece up and try and flip it over because it just is there's too much water and it's mm -hmm. too floppy. Um, so if you do need to flip it to uh, clean up the back, I would say you want to wait until it's really at that hard leather hard stage. Uh, and then of course you can't just flip it onto the table or you're going to crush all of this decoration. So you'd need to flip it over onto a piece of foam or ideally I would you know put it in my uh, left hand like this, put my other hand underneath flip it over and kind of hold it while I do this. Um, but for the most part, I would say I don't, I don't very often do that. I always just try uh, and clean up the underside while it's sitting on the table like this. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. It was really amazing to see all these, um, all the details uh, that go into your, your making process. And I think that um, everyone found it fascinating based on the comments that, um, that we receive and very informative. Um, so thank you for being here with us today. If you want to see Lindsay's work, of course, you can see a great example um, up in, on the third floor at the Gardner Museum in our special exhibition, where she uh, created a series that demonstrates the Mayolica production uh, process. Um, we also have many pieces um, uh, currently um, on view in the Gardner shop. And then um, you might have some other exhibitions going on. I don't know if you want to mention anything. <laughs> I don't have any exhibitions going on in Toronto now, but I will um, this coming March, I'll be um, curating and participating in a group, group show at May 10's projects. Um, so May. if anybody's interested in that, you can yes. follow me on Instagram and I'll be promoting uh, all of my upcoming projects there. And thank you very much, Corrine, for, uh, for the opportunity today. Thank you. Uh, so th thanks again, Lindsay, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we have uh, some more um, digital programs tied to our current exhibition, so please join us for our next le virtual lecture, Questioning Qu Quarantine in the Jewish Ghetto of Venice, which will be delivered by Dana Katz, and that's on December 9, 2021, um, and taking place again on a Thursday from 1 to 2. So thanks everyone for being here today. Thank you, Lindsay, and I wish you all a great day. Bye. <laughs>